Hello future RMTs, welcome to our discussion and our topic for today is all about diagnostic parasitology. Our learning outcomes or objectives are as follows to differentiate the principles of each test in parasitology as well as to identify the appropriate samples in detecting parasites. Now, remember guys that parasitic diseases are established based on the signs and symptoms manifested by the patient that is due to the invasion of the parasite. If you still remember in our discussion in the pre-recorded lecture about the introduction to parasitology, I have mentioned there that you have to remember guys that para parasites are classified can be classified based on their habitat or its habitat in the human body. So basically, that's the same thing. The signs and symptoms that will be manifested by the patient depends on the habitat of the parasite. Okay? A correct diagnosis of the parasite is necessary in order for us to have a prompt and correct no, treatment. Because if we, if we will not be able to detect the parasite accordingly, okay, it will affect also the treatment, the management of the doctor. As, as you discussed or as we said, medical technology is an essential part of the diagnostic team. Therefore, it is important for you as a student, as a young <clears throat> student, no, to take note and remember on how are we going to identify, classify, distinguish, Parasites. Okay? Now, uh, confirm, a, confirm a clinical impression is one of the goal of the parasitology laboratory. That is one of the goals. Kung bakit, why do we have to perform laboratory tests? The signs and symptoms of the patient will be uh, justified by the results of your analysis. Okay? Uh, Aside from that, the condition has a parasitic nurture. Okay? And performing appropriate laboratory tests in terms of parasitic infection or in, in terms of detecting parasitic infection can rule out differential diagnosis. What is the condition or what parasite is present that causes infection to the human? Okay? And of course, Another goal of this is to aid the clinician in the choice of a proper medication. If a, if a patient is suffering from ascaris, lumbricoides, or any helminthic infection, and the doctor will give metronidazole, it's inappropriate. Because metronidazole is an antibiotic given to a patient with a protozoal infection. Therefore, we have to test. We have to perform the test accurately. Okay? Now, for the demonstration of the parasites, okay, samples may demonstrate either of the following. Egg, larvae, or adult. Uh, adult, larvae, cyst, oocyst, trophozoic, and antigens. No? For, uh, for adult larvae, egg, cyst, oocyst, and troposoids, typically the sample is stool. Sometimes sputum. Sometimes we can use urine. No? But for antigens, definitely, no, we can use blood. Stool samples may also be used for EIA. Okay? Now, when is the right time to collect sample for the parasitic infection during the patent stage of the infection? Meaning to say, this is the time wherein the patient is experiencing signs and symptoms. Now, there are some cases that parasites are not detected or demonstrated in active infection like schistosomas, wherein you know, it can be detected on the latter part. Like what I've said, immunological assays are also important or can also be useful in detecting parasites. Okay? Most especially if the parasite is still immature and the medical technologist is having a hard time to find or to identify the parasite. Therefore, 
immunological assays will be the one to use no, in order to detect the antigen of the parasites. Now, if you still remember, uh, I said that most of our parasites are gastrointestinal invaders or they reside in the gastrointestinal tract. Therefore, stool is the most commonly submitted sample in parasitology laboratory since GIT is the most common habitat of the parasites. Aside from that, since parasite may vary or may, may uh, they are erratic, no? they can also reside in other organs. Let's say, for example, in urinary bladder, urine can be useful. Vaginal area for trichomonas vaginalis, urine can be useful. Blood. There are parasites that invades RBC, example of which is Plasmodium and Babesia, Trypanosomes or Trypanosoma, and uh, filarial worms can also be demonstrated using blood samples. Sputum. Sputum is a sample or a body fluid that can demonstrate Paragonimus westermani or other helminthic parasites such as Echinococcus granulosus, Ascaris lumbricoides, and hookworm, as well as strongyloides. Because Ascaris, strongyloides, and hookworm, they are capable of what we call heart-lung migration. Okay? Cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is also a body fluid that can demonstrate the presence of the parasite. Example of which is the detection of acantamoeba or neg and Nagleria fowleri. Tissue aspirates or tissue biopsy is useful for tissue invaders, in, invader parasites. For example, we have Trichinella spiralis, Draconculus medinensis, and some filarial worms can also be detected using tissue aspirate or tissue biopsy. Tenia solium, as another example, can also be demonstrated using the aspirate or tissue biopsy aside from simple, simply using stool samples. I have here the summary of the specimen and the parasites that can be seen. I've provided this uh, slide already or the picture of this uh, slide already in your LMS. Okay, so just read it and have a copy of it and remember. Okay. Now, let's discuss first stool as the most commonly submitted sample in the clinical parasitology laboratory. Remember guys that it is important to take note of the life cycle of the parasite as life cycle is an important factor in order for us to correctly identify the presence of the parasite. Okay? As well as the frequency and the timing of the collection. Okay? Again, it is necessary to collect samples during the patent stage of the infection. Now, in demonstrating, in demonstrating parasites using stool, we are going to collect the sample in a wide mount clean container with tight fitting lid. Okay? A pea size is recommended. Okay? And this stool is recommended to demonstrate the presence of the parasite. And as well as, as, well as we can demonstrate or we can differentiate what is or what are the morphological forms of the parasite present? Let's say, for example, I have here in, uh, in the picture, uh, Georgia intestinalis or Georgia lambia. On the left side of the screen, we have there the trophozoid. On the other side, we have there the cyst. Okay? Which can be detected in stool samples. However, as we go along, you will realize that not all trophozoids can be demonstrated in stool samples because they are sensitive in the external environment and they are easily destroyed. That's why mostly in or most uh, morphological forms seen in stool for protozoans is the cyst because cysts are resistant into the external environment and they have this thick protective cell covering that enables them to survive in the external environment. Now, what we have to take note when submitting stool sample. Now, 
not only stool sample but also the other other samples. You have to take note that the patient's name is correct, the age, the sex, the date and the time of the collection is necessary because the date and time will give us an assumption if we are going to reject the sample or not. The requesting position should also be included. The requested procedure must be also uh, included in the in the requisition slip. Okay, the presumptive diagnosis for correlation of the results, prior infections and travel history. These factors or these informations are useful, no, in order for us to correlate the results of our analysis. Now, what are the factors to consider? In collecting stool sample, we have to take note the intake of drugs and medicinal substances because as this, this may affect the results or this may affect the integrity of our samples as well as the intake of antibiotics. If the patient took already or take already antibiotics such as uh, protozoal antibiotics or uh, metronidazole, definitely it will be too hard for us not to demonstrate or to detect the presence of the parasites because the parasite might, might be disintegrated already by the actions of the antibiotics. Another thing is, even though that the wide mount container can contain up to 60 ml of sample, it is not required to fill up the, uh, the specimen container. A pea-sized sample or a 2 to 5 grams sample, a thumb shape or thumb sized sample is necessary, is enough already for us to perform the test. If the sample is watery, okay, if the sample is watery, 5 to 6 tablespoons. Now, you might wonder how can you collect or how can you have a 5 to 6 watery sample? Now, Remember that the urine sa uh, the, the stool sample should not be contaminated with toilet water, urine, or soil. Why? Toilet water may contain contaminants. Urine can destroy protozo uh, tropozoids. Okay? So how are we going to collect that? You are going to collect that using a plastic, no? And then get a... The, the specimen container has a spoon and then you collect it using the spoon. Okay. Now, take note that the age of the sample should not be more than 30 minutes. According to Strasinger, you know, according to Strasinger, a stool sample is still viable for one hour. But we have to take note that it is better to test the sample freshly collected. Okay. The delay in the processing of the specimen can alter the integrity of the sample. However, preservatives may be used. No? Preservatives may be used to preserve the integrity. However, there are disadvantages of using preservatives. Okay. Now, like what I'm saying, stool preservatives is useful to preserve protozoal mor morphologic uh, features. Okay. Again, take note. Fixative will preserve the protozoan morphological features. While for the helminths, now it prevents the possible destruction of the eggs and larvae. You can preserve the structure of the egg of helminths. However, permanent staining should be considered a fixation. There is a principle in clinical laboratory for parasitology. If you are going to fix stool sample, no, in the slide, it is considered as a fixed sample already. Okay, so we have here formalin. Formalin is considered as the all-purpose fixative. It is not only used in clinical parasitology laboratory, but also used in. Uh, Histology laboratory or histopathology laboratory. No? A absolute formalin is 40% in concentration. No? A absolute formalin is 40% in concentration. Now remember, if we are going to preserve 
uh, protozoans, the recommended or the ideal concentration of formalin is 5%. For helminths, is 10%. Now, since formalin is a, is a eye irritating, a nose irritating, and a skin irritating, we can use the buffered formalin. No? Okay, which can preserve the morphological characteristics of the parasite. Now, remember that formalin can be used no, in concentrated analysis or concentration techniques such as formalin ether acetate uh, technique or ethyl acetate concentration or ethyl acetate technique. Aside from formalin, we have the shodins. Shodin solution is used to preserve stool sample in staining methods. However, the problem with shodins is it contains mercury chloride, which is considered as a toxic, a potential toxic to humans. And since it contains mercury chloride, the major disadvantage of this fixative is the disposal. Because mercury, as we all know, is a dangerous element. Aside from that, we have the PV, the PVA uh, or the uh, polyvinyl alcohol. This is a plastic resin that that makes the stool adhere in the slide. No, uh, PVA is a useful for protozoan cyst and trophozoite. However, the same thing with uh, shodins; it contains mercury chloride. You might be familiar with this one because you can see this in the manicure set of your mother or your, your you as a girl, no? Nakikita niyo itong uh, benzalconium chloride. Now, remember that mertiolet, iodine formalin or MIF, contains trimazole or iodine, which is a good component of staining, no? And MIF contains the formalin, which serves as the Fixative. Okay. Now, take note that MIF is recommended for intestinal protozoans, helminths, and larvae. Aside from that, we have what we call the sodium acetate acetic acid formalin, which is a useful, no? Because it has a long shelf life. What do we mean long shelf, shelf life or shelf life? Hindi po siya madaling ma-expire. And another advantage of using the SAF is it does not contain mercury chloride. Okay, so we have here the methods of examination of our stool. The stool examination is divided into two phases. Number one, we have the macroscopic examination, and the other two, and the other one is the microscopic examination. For macroscopic examination of stool, it includes the color and the consistency of the stool. The importance of performing the macroscopic examination of stool is that it will give us a primary assessment of what is the condition of the patient. Okay? So the consistency of the stool may be, may, may be formed, semi-form, soft, loose, or watery. Okay? Now, uh, trophozoites is usually found in soft or liquid stools. Cyst can be found in form or semi-form stool. Okay, we have here the Bristol stool chart, wherein it gives us the six or the seven type of stool, from type one to type seven. And I want you to take note that type four stool with uh, smooth sausage-like or snake-like is the normal appearance of the stool based on the Bristol stool of chart. Okay? Now, what is the purpose of examining the stool color? The purpose of examining the stool color is, like what I've said, it can be an indicative of the presence of the parasite. If the stool is pale, if the stool is dark, no? And aside from that, aside from that is, uh, it it will give us the primary investigation. Okay, 
Now remember that the presence of blood should always be reported. A dark colored stool is associated with upper gastrointestinal bleeding and a bright red stool is associated in a bleeding in the lower gastrointestinal tract. You might wonder why upper gastrointestinal tract bleeding will give us a black colored stool or a dark colored stool. It is because that the RBC no, from the bleeding destroyed already. Naglice na po siya. That's why it gives us a dark colored stool. Okay? A blood and mucoid, a mucoid or mucus, a soft sample or sometimes watery, is an indicative of the presence of trochozoid in the sample. So by just simply looking into the stool sample macroscopically, we can assume already what is the presence or what is the parasite that can be present in the stool sample. Okay. Now, the second phase of the microscopic examination of the stool includes the detection of the fecal elements. What are the fecal elements that can be seen in the stool? We have the RBC, the WBC, or the PMNS. PMNS is usually known as the WBC. PMNS is also known as your polymorphonuclear cells. RBC, no macrophages, charcot-laden crystals, epithelial cells, yeast, and plant elements. When we said WBC, the clinical significance of the presence of WBC in the stool is inflammation, eosinophils, no? And the presence of eosinophils in the stool is an indication of immune response to the parasitic infection. RBC is indicative of bleeding or ulcerations, ulcerations that can be caused by the parasite itself. Macrophages are bacterial and parasitic infections, meaning to say, these macrophages are starting to engulf these parasites or bacteria that can be present in the stool. charcot laden crystals is an indication of the in disintegration of the eosinophils, which is an indicative of hypersensitivity and parasitic infections. Epithelial cells is normally seen in the stool sample. Yeast is an indication of a fungal infection, while plant elements can serve as a confusers. No? Wala siyang masyadong clinical significant. Kinoconfuse ka lang ni plant, ni plant elements. Okay? So this is charcot laden crystal. No? This is a WBC, an RBC. No, no, no. WBC. This is a yeast, a budding yeast. No? This is also a WBC. And this is an example of a macrophage. Now techniques. We have what we call the direct fecal smear. And what is with direct fecal smear? Direct fecal smear is also known as the Fecalysis. Direct fecal smear is also known as the uh, also known as the stool analysis. Okay. Direct fecal smear is also known as the ONP examination. From the word itself, direct fecal smear using the stool sample, you are just going to immerse stool sample in a 0.85 to 0.90% NSS. Don't you worry, I will provide a separate video on how to perform a direct fecal smear. Direct fecal smear allows us to detect the presence of a motile parasites, most especially protozoans. Okay? However, even though it allows us to detect the motility or the, uh, the detection of the motile protozoans, using direct fecal smear you know, to identi identify protozoans will uh, give us a challenge. Why? Kasi masyado siyang mahirap hanapin. Because the parasites are clear. Unlike if we are going to use Lugol's iodine. 
A Lugol Sayudin will give us a better visualization of the seas. However, no? remember, Lugol Sayudin destroys tropozoids. No? Lugol Sayudin destroys tropozoids. Now, how about cathotic uh, smear? Cathotic smear uses 5 to 6 grams of a stool sample or a 2 mag bin uh, stool size. No? There is a cardboard with a hole wherein you are going to put the stool sample. We are going to use glycerin as a clearing agent. And the purpose of the clearing agent is to eliminate confusers or contaminants. No? And another purpose of that is for us to detect easily the parasites. Okay? We also use malachite green. And the purpose of that is to give a pale green background. What is the purpose of having a pale green background? Para mas medali natin makita. Yung parasite. Remember that cathotic is useful for Ascaris lumbricoides and Trichuris trichura. Okay? But, cathotic is not recommended for diuric and watery stool sample. No? Because we cannot, we cannot have a thick smear because of watery stool sample. Okay, aside from that, we have concentration techniques. Concentration techniques, naman, on the other hand, is used to detect the parasites na yun lang. Okay? Uh, there are two principles, sedimentation and flotation. Kapag sedimentation, the SG of the parasite or the specific gravity of the parasite is greater than the specific gravity of the reagent. That's why the parasite can be seen on the sediment at the bottom of the suspension. While if flotation technique, no, the, the specific gravity of the parasite is lesser than the specific gravity of the reagent which allows the egg of the parasite to float in the suspension. Take note that flotation technique have a clearer smear. Okay? Now, for sedimentation procedures, we have acid eater concentration technique. Acid eater, from the word itself, acid, it uses 40% hydrochloric solution. What is the purpose of using acid? The purpose of using, a, the purpose of using acid is to dissolve the albuminous material that can be found in the stool. Eater, on the other hand, dissolves neutral fats in the stool. Why? Why do we have to do this? The purpose of that is the purpose of that is to eliminate the confusers and for us to detect only the parasite. Clearer. Wala kang confusers. Okay? Acid eater concentration technique is useful for trichuris, capillaria, and schistosoma. However, the downside of acid eater concentration technique is the loss of the parasites to the plug of the debris. And aside from that, destruction of protozoan cysts. The reason why acid eater concentration technique is not useful for protozoans. On the other hand, we have the formalin ether or formalin ethyl acetate concentration technique. This is usually referred as the FEACT. Okay? It uses 10... Oh my God. It uses 10% formalin. Okay? And remember, as we said a while ago, 
formalin is considered as a all-purpose fixative. Again, the purpose of ether is to dissolve neutral fat. However, if you still remember the, the characteristics of ether, madali siyang madissolve, right? That's why we can use ethyl acetate, which is a more efficient than ether. No, more efficient than ether. Formalin ether uh, acetate or formalin ether concentration technique is useful for the recovery of helminths and protozoan cysts. Now, for flotation technique, we have zinc sulfate flotation, which uses 33% of zinc sulfate. No? And the ideal specific gravity of the reagent must be 1.18 to 1.20. Okay? Now, if the parasites are exposed to high specific gravity, it will result into distortion and shrinkage of the protozoan cysts. Okay, makikita ang daan. That's why we have to consider the specific gravity no, of our reagent in zinc sulfate flotation. Because if the specific gravity is higher than 1.20, it will distort the cyst of the protozoans as well as the, the nematodes with thin wall. No? Kaya, kaya dapat regulated. Kaya dapat na may measure ng husay or chinecheck muna yung specific gravity. Now, for Brimes flotation, it uses saturated table salt solution. And what is the good thing for brine flotation? There is no need for centrifugation because hell means rise on the surface. No? However, brine flotation is not useful for operculated eggs. Where when you said operculated, there is a lid like structure on the egg of the helminths. We also have the Sheeter's sugar flotation. Sheeter's sugar flotation uses boiled sugar solution which is preserved with phenol. Okay. Now remember that the Sheeter's sugar flotation is recommended for Cryptosporidium, Cyclospora, and Cytoisospora. We also have culture techniques or stool culture methods. Number one, we have the capro technique. In capro technique or capro culture, it uses moistened soil with granulated charcoal. The purpose of granulated charcoal is to activate, no, to activate the environment so that the sample will demonstrate the presence of parasite. Aside from that, we have what we call Haradamori. Haradamori is a culture technique that will differentiate the presence of hookworm and strongyloides. The filariform that moves downwards suggests that there is a presence of a hookworm. Filariform that moves uh, upwards suggests that there is a strongyloides. This is upwards, huh? This is upwards. Downwards is hookworm. Upwards is strongyloides. Now, in egg counting procedure, we have here the table according to WHO. And this table will help us to identify the intensity of the infection. This is usually used for soil transmitted helminths such as Ascaris lumbricoides, Trichuris trichuria, hookworm, and Schistosoma japonicum. In a stool sample with 1 to 4,999 eggs, it can be detected or it can be interpreted as light intensity infection with Ascaris lumbricoides. 1 to 999 egg for Trichuris trichuria, 1 to 1,999 egg is for hookworm. And 1 to 99 egg, EPG is eggs per gram. No? 
for Shisusoma Japonicum and Shisusoma Manasani. Okay, so please take note of this one. Now, Kato Katz is differ from Kato Tik. Okay, almost the same yung principle. Okay, however, in Kato Katz, it uses uniform size of the stool sample. Okay, all eggs can be seen and should be counted accordingly. It is useful for schistosomas, ascaris, trichuris, and hookworm. Now, remember that Katokat's method is only useful for our form stool. You also have the stool egg count, which uses a, a 1.0 normal sodium hydroxide. Okay? And stall egg count requires form stool. We can also stain stool samples. And staining of stool samples will give us a better visualization of the parasite. Okay? For better visualization, most especially of protozoans. If you have, if you can see this or uh, look at this, this is an example of a cyst of Jarjalambia. This is the Balantidium coli no? with a visible macronucleus. Okay? Now, however, uh, acid fast or periodic acid shift, charcoal, black E, and trichome, as well as iron hematoxylin, is not recommended for cryptosporidium, cyclospora, and cytoisospora. Okay? Ano naman yung recommended sa kanila? Recommended sa kanila is yung Kenyon's method. We also have the acid fast stain, which requires a thin layer of stool. No? Kapag ang nakita natin is cryptosporidium, cyclospora, or cyclo cytoisospora, the parasite appears as red or pink. And the background of the stool or the smear is blue to green. The same thing as this one. This is an example of a parasite no, seen in a acid fast stain. This is cryptosporidium. Now, in order to differentiate cryptosporidium from cyclospora, no, since both of which are spherical in shape, Unlike cytoisospora, which is ovoidal, the si cryptosporidium is 4 to 5 micrometers, while the si cyclospora is 8 to 10 micrometers. Perineal swab is recommended for the recovery of enterobius vermicularis egg and tenia species. Now take note that the perineal swab for enterobius vermicularis must be done early morning. Why? Because the egg uh, because the gravid female of Enterobius vermicularis lays its egg in the evening. Therefore, early morning is the appropriate term or the appropriate time not to collect the sample. This is how we're going to collect the sample. You will ask the patient to do this position. No open their uh, poet, no? They're about the, the, you know, that, that area, no? And then using a uh, tongue depressor or popsicle stick, doon mo ilalagay yung muna ang iyong tape, yung cellophane tape. And then press the perianal region and then after that, no, uh, adhere the tape to the glass slide for a microscopic examination. Tenia species can also be seen in the perianal swab. No? And the the morphological form is the proglotids, no? yung body segment ng ating tenia. Now, for examination of blood, these are the parasites that can be seen in the blood. We have the filaria, we have the plasmodium, we have trypanosoma and babesia. This one represents filarial worm. This is a ring form of a malaria. This is trypanosoma, no? a trypanosome. And this is 
a representation of Babesia inside the RBC. Okay, a finger prick blood sample is recommended because EDTA can lyse the parasite. Okay? And EDTA can dilute the parasite. Okay? A wet fresh preparation is recommended for the recovery of microfilariae and trypomastigote of our trypanosoma. Okay? Using wet or fresh preparation of the blood will help us to see the motil uh, trypomastigote and microfilariae. However, if we are going to use wet or fresh preparation, it will not, it will not uh, allow us to identify the parasite. Now, for the stained smear, we have what we call the thick and the thin smear. Thick and thin smear is ideal for the identification and screening of malarial parasite. Take note that a thick smear, I will demonstrate and I will give you also a separate video lecture on thick and thin smear. Okay. Remember guys that a thick smear no, is done, ito yung thick smear is done with the use of 2 to 3 drops of blood. And then we are going to make a circular motion to make a thick smear. Remember that the thick smear must be dehemoglobinized using a buffer solution. And the purpose of that is so that we can detect, we can screen malarial species. Okay, take note. Thick smear is for detection and screening. We cannot use thick smear for identification. Now, the thin smear, no, parang lang yung, yung blood smear nyo, with a feathery edge, no, the slide is fixed with methanol so that it will not uh, wash sa pag phoenix. The, ticks, the thin smear is recommended for identification of malarial species. Again, take note. Thick smear, screening. Thin smear, identification. Now here are the useful blood stain, a uh, blood stains, no? And the corresponding color of the structures that can be seen in the blood. Capillary tube method is useful for the detection of microfilariae and trypanosoma since they can be found on the buffico. So paano po 'yan? Using a capillary tube, no, maglalagay ng finger prick blood. Okay? And then, this centrifuge, uh, this capillary tube will be centrifuge using microhematocrit centrifuge. And then, a cut must be done between the RBC and the plasma to get the buffy coat. Okay? Again, remember, the buffy coat is useful for the detection of microfilariae and trypanosome. Microfilariae and your uh, Remember, that is your buffy coat. So, kapag na, na broke na yun, like what I'm saying, so this with this is what looks like. Okay. Now, for the quantitative analysis of buffy coat, it uses capillary tube coated with acridine orange and potassium oxalate. And the purpose of this one is this is a radiographic dye or an ultraviolet dye no, which allows no, the adherence of our parasite. Now, quantitative bubble coat is recommended for malarial parasites, microfilariae, trypanosomes, and babesia. Venous blood can be used for the detection of microfilariae. Pero most of the times, what we are going to use is finger prick. Why? Because uh, it will not, it, it, it does not contain, no? it does not contain, uh, what you call this, it does not contain uh, anticoagulant no? that will dilute the parasite. 
Nut concentration is useful also for the detection of microfilaria, wherein you have 1 ml of the blood plus 10 ml of formalin, and then study it. For membrane filtration, it also allows the detection of microfilariae, wherein the syringe is attached to Sweeney Hill filter holder. For the examination of the sputum, no, uh, there are parasites that can be revealed through the sputum. Like what I've said, Ascaris lumbricoides, Strongyloides sterculis, and hookworm are what we call the ash. No, ash, ash, ash. May kanta yan eh, ash. Bakit po sila tinawag na ash? Because they are what we call capable of heart-lung migration. They can migrate from heart to lungs and so back and forth, going to intestine. That's why sputum can be used to demonstrate the egg. Yun nga lang, ano po yung routine? Ano yung specimen of choice for ascaris, for strongyloides and hookworm? Definitely, since these are soil transmitted parasites, the usual or the most common sample is still the uh, stool. However, like I've said, we can also use sputum for the recovery of these parasites. Paragonimus mastermani requires sputum as the specimen of choice. Because Paragonimus mastermani, a trematode, causes paragonomiasis. No? Paragonomiasis. Okay. It also causes hemoptosis, a blood streak sputum. Okay. Echinococcus granulosus, on the other hand, a sustode parasite, can also be detected using sputum. Now take note, in Tamiba histolytica, we said that in Tamiba histolytica is a protozoan parasite that invades the gastrointestinal tract. However, it can also invade our lungs. And the invasion of that entamoeba histolytica trophozoid in the lungs can cause pulmonary amoebic abscess. Thus, it requires sputum or pulmonary abscess as the sample. Cryptosporidium parvum oocyst can also be seen in the sputum. Entamoeba gingivalis and Trichomonas tenax, both are commensal, can also be used, uh, can also be detected using sputum. Now remember that the first morning specimen is the best sample to collect. Why? Because it it does not contain food stuff. Walang mga uh, Confusers. You can use inductants like 10% sodium, sodium chloride in uh, hydro, hydrochloric or hydrogen peroxide. Inductants para lumabas yung sputum. The same thing goes with the stool. It is collected in disposable, impermeable, tightly covered containers. So your question, can we use Stool container, pwede naman. Provided that it is sterile and not contaminated with stool. Definitely. Okay? So, for the macroscopic examination or gross examination of the sputum, the consistency includes mucus, mucoid, purulent, and a blood. Now, a color is an indicative of the cellular composition. If the sputum is yellowish or yellow, it, it means there is a presence of increased number of pus. When we said pus, P-U-S, it means WBC. Greenish tint is an indicative of pseudomonas. Bright red is a recent bleeding, and a rustic colored sputum is an indication of the breakdown of hemoglobin. For wet mount preparation of sputum, saline or iodine can be useful for the protozoans. No? And for sputum concentration, we use 3% sodium hydroxide, which is added to viscous or veritic sputum. Supernatant is discarded and the sediment is examined microscopically.
Now, for urine, the specimen of choice is usually morning urine. Okay? However, for schistosoma hematobium, the recommended or the ideal sample is 24-hour unpreserved urine. Okay? Urine sample is usually useful, useful no? for trichomonas vaginalis and schistosoma hematobium. Okay? Now, remember that schistosoma hematobium is a blood-dwelling trematode. You might wonder, Sir, a blood-dwelling trematode, but the sample of choice is urine? How come? Yeah, you, are, you heard it right. No, you heard it right. That is a blood-dwelling trematode, but the sample of choice is urine because it resides on the mesentric vein of the bladder and it penetrates the urinary bladder which causes uh, hematuria kapag umiihi because of the spine on the egg of hematobium. This is a terminal spine that can be seen in schistosoma hematobium. Okay. Tissue aspirates, no? uh, samples can be, can be acquired from liver, duodenum, bronchial, lymph nodes, and skin. <coughs> Now, for examination of the tissue aspirates, remember, liver is the most common organ involved in extra-intestinal parasitism. No? And it can be useful for uh, uh, detection of hepatic abscess. Remember, entamoeba histolytica can be seen in the liver. Entamoeba histolytica is capable of producing abscess. The same thing goes with Echinococcus granulosus, lalong lalo na yan. No? This is the egg of Echinococcus granulosus. Actually, Echinococcus, Echinococcus granulosus is formerly known as Tania granulosus. That's why the egg of Echinococcus granulosus is indistinguishable to the egg of Tania species. Okay? Pero yung egg ni Echinococcus granulosus, seldom lang siyang makita. Usually, yung mga hydatid cyst niya ang nakikita sa mga aspirates or even in any other sample. As you can see, this is a CT scan of a liver. This is the liver and this area is the area of abscess. Okay? Now, for duodenal aspirate, a duodenal aspirate is recommended for Georgia Lambia and Strongyloides steric release. Okay, ano yung ginagawa dito? Meron tayong entero test or string test na tinatawag wherein a capsule with a string will will be swallowed by a patient. And after 4 hours of incubation sa stomach ni patient, hihilahin yun so that the patient will vomit. And in this capsule, no? In this capsule, merong mag-a-adhere na sample. Aside from that, uh, skin samples or aspirates can be useful for the detection of Leishmania. No? For, orient, uh, for oriental sore or cutaneous Leishmaniasis. Oriental sore caused by Leishmania species. No? Oriental sore is a form of leishmaniasis. Okay? And what can be seen in the, in the aspirate, a mastigot, which is a morphological form of hemoflagellate. So we're going to discuss that in, in the next topic. Topics, no? Particularly in hemoflagellates. How about for CSF? For CSF, you can... Uh, detect Trypanosoma cruzi, Trypanosoma bruzi, Rodiense, Trypanosoma bruzi, Gabiense, Negleria fowleri, and Parastrongulus cantonensis. No? And CSF must be examined immediately because Trypanosigote will perish within 20 minutes and Negleria fowleri trapezoid motility is also affected if the sample is not tested immediately or examined immediately. For tissue biopsy material, we have trichinella spiralis. No? We can also have tinea solium. 
which is a result of cystocerbosis in the brain. Okay? And muscle biopsy is also recommended for spirometra. All right. For rectal biopsy, the pre it reveals the presence of schistosoma japonicum because schistosoma japonicum resides in the mesenteric vein of the rectum. Okay? Uh, this one, letter A shows a tissue of a brain with a cystocercosis. No? Cystocercus in brain, this one. This is the cystocercus. Cystosoma japonicum ova in the ovary. I don't know how I would, how can I zoom this, but you will see the egg of Cystosoma japonicum with lateral spine here. Medyo ni ko lang alam on how can I zoom this. Ah, uh, ayun. Pwede pa ba? Hindi na. Hindi ko na ma-zoom ng husay. Yan. Ah, uh, here, ito yan. Itong area na to, dyan nandoon yung egg ng Shisosoma japonicum in the ovary. Could you imagine? Shisosoma japonicum resides in the intestine, mesenteric veins of the intestine. No? Nag-penetrate na siya papuntang ovary. Okay? Yet I see japonicum in fallopian tube. So the same thing goes with this one. Ito yan. Yan. Okay? And that colon with aden adenocarcinoma with schistosoma ova. So, ito yung letter D. Okay? So, these are the organs and the parasites that can be isolated. Okay? And there you have it. Thank you very much and I hope you learn. See you in our reinforcement session.